So um, I know this because I've been sort of chatting to you for a while, but um, I, I think you get known quite a lot for obviously serverless, serverless spaces where you hang around a lot and Lambda is, that's why we've been talking about Lambda. But um, SSO is a, yeah. SSO is a thing. That's, that's almost like your new thing. Like, <laughs> well, yeah. So I've been deep into it because I want to, um, I want the, the model that it has for how you interact, how you authenticate into AWS is better. Yeah. Yep. And we should, we should clarify here. Well, so, and in terms of areas that I care about, right? Um, there is serverless. There's also IoT. Right. Um, there's also, uh, if you go by the AWS org structure, management and governance with CloudFormation. Okay. Yes. And then there's security and identity with all of all of it, right? Because I care about the attribute-based access control that we're getting for IAM. I care about the provable uh, um, access findings that we're getting from IAM Access Analyzer. And now, like, apparently this VPC yes. uh, analyzer yes, is built on new. the same stuff. Right. Um, and all of that's really cool and will give us better tools for managing the access that we have. Mm -hmm. um, but that all, right, all of that like I am ABAC stuff um, happens after you're authenticated. And the frustrating thing is, you know, A, no one should be I am users. I am users should be renamed I am long lived access keys because fundamentally those are useful for your on prem servers that do not have humans on them. Mm -hmm. And so they're, they're like the complete opposite of users. Sure. They're machines. Um, and uh, you want to avoid those unless you absolutely need to have those long lived credentials. Yep. So instead you want to bring your identity from somewhere else. And you can use, you know, so AWS SSO has a built-in identity store um, that, uh, um, that you can use if you don't have your own identity provider. So you can set that up, you can set up the MFA, you can have passwords, you know, all, the whole thing. Yep. I think most companies come into it with and with their own IDP, For whether sure. that's Active Directory um, or G Suite, Okta, Ping, yep. One Login. Uh, G Suite is one of these things where, unfortunately, you can authenticate G Suite into AWS SSO. You can't yet sync your directory. Oh, okay. Um, okay. So, like with Okta, you can hook it up so that all of your Okta users show up in AWS SSO, and you can attach permissions to those users and groups and such. Yep. Um, and with Google, with G Suite, um, you can do the SAML part of it, which is the authentication, but the offline sync of sending the directory over um, isn't there. And I guess it's sort of waiting on a on a standardized framework for something. I don't know. Okay. Um, but it's disappointing that it's not there because there's lots of people who are using G Suite who would love to just plug it in. Yeah, for sure. So, so uh, yeah, and I don't want to, that's yep. not a rabbit hole we should necessarily disappear into. But so how, how do you, how do you assign permissions in SSO to people from a G Suite environment then? So what you do is you have to manually create them right, inside uh, right, right. AWS SSO, oh, no, that which sucks. for a small organization is okay. Yeah. Because yeah. Right? you only have to do that once. You would create the groupings that you have inside AWS SSO, I think. Yeah, okay. Um, so you would say, oh, this is a group of users. And so it's not managed at your IDP layer, which is where I think the ideal is. Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but so it still works. You can but still it's just do manual. It. It's, not, right. it's not scalable um, in the way that you would like it to a large organization. Yeah. Um, but so I think the, um, so the cool thing about it, right? So it does a couple of things. One is um, that it allows you a standardized way of, of putting permissions across your organization. So instead of having I am roles in individual accounts that all happen to have the same policy yeah. and the same name. Instead, you're saying in one central place, here's a collection of permissions and I'm handing those permissions to these people or groups in these particular accounts. Yeah, and so, and when you said organization, you're talking about an AWS organization account structure. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, you can't currently say, I wanna hand this permission to these people in this 
OU in this organization. You can't right. just do it sort of. And then when you add or remove an account from that OU, that it just automatically works. Um, that's I think a big request that like high on my list yep. of, of things I would like. Um, uh, but it means that you have a centralized view of it. It doesn't mean that you necessarily have to centralize the control over the permissions that get created and the assignments as they're called of those permissions to people and accounts, right? Multiple teams could be um, operating on that AWS SSO. Um, I think uh, there's a good opportunity there for CICD. I'm saying there's a, there, the definition of all these permissions is in source control. Um, and then uh, it's deployed through CloudFormation into it. Um, so that's one half of it, which is great for governance. Now, of course, the features on it are uh, somewhat more limited today than everything you can do with IAM roles, just because the functionality sort of hasn't caught up yet. Mm -hmm. They only just announced ABAC, and that happens at the sort of global level. So uh, when a user authenticates, the SAML assertion can include principal tags to include on the session, or you can also have a mapping that allows you to pick up attributes from their uh, from their from the directory. So right. if your IDP has synced in that they're in a particular department, you can pick that up and make that a tag on the session. Sure, which is useful. And can yeah. you use that in conditional policies to say look oh, for yeah. those things? Because because I have a problem in this space, um, and that's MFA. And this is going deep. I hope everyone likes this, but th th this is. Um, so when when you have an IAM user or, or a, um, a, a role that you've assumed as an IAM user, you can have MFA, you can have that conditional um, element in the policy to say, if they've got MFA, then allow them to do this. And one thing that one sort of like kind of easy catch all is um, make sure that it, in order to assume this role, as in from a yep. centralized account into a different account, cross account authentication, in order to assume this role, make sure they have MFA. And then if they do, then you can kind of say, fine, go, go do whatever you want to do, because I know that the only reason you can be here is because you had MFA and that's within the domain of AWS. Now with SSO, um, even if we're talking about using the actual built-in identity store within side of SSO, um, which is what I do with my own personal accounts, for example, um, yeah. yet you can set up MFA, awesome. But you can't, as far as I can see, um, have any kind of conditional thing on a policy to say only let this user do it if they're MFA. And so I, think I struggle the, with that. Yeah, I think the trick there is, so the STS assume roll call takes in the MFA code. Right. So, 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 where, where's this? So, I understand where the SDS assume role is happening in pre-SSO oh. days. Is it also happening in? I'm saying, I'm saying, if we think about the okay, okay. the the pre-SSO days, right? Yeah, yeah, okay. That yeah. assume role call takes the MFA code in it, so you can choose to assume that role, and say, I'm not going to provide an MFA code, or you can choose to assume a role and provide an MFA code. And the trick there is your IDP, whether it's the SSO built-in directory or an external IDP, is making a decision about whether the user needs MFA or not at the authentication time back there. Mm -hmm. And so the question would be, right, okay, so, you know, ping prompts you for your YubiKey when you sign in, or they don't. They decide that for whatever reason, you know, there, there is, is this adaptive MFA and things like that, right? That don't always prompt for it. Okay, so then they've done that and that gets them eventually into AWS credentials. Now your policy says whether they have MFA or not, right? Uh, to, whether to allow based on this MFA present or not. The problem is that the user way back when they're signing into ping, it doesn't have control over whether they're providing the MFA or not. Mm -hmm. And so there isn't a mechanism in there for the user thinking, I'm going to go be doing this. I need to somehow tell Ping to, to prompt me for MFA, right? Like it's a weird thing. Yep, so yep. you can still do that, that thing at the end, which is saying, okay, I have a role that's very high privilege and I'm going to attach an actual MFA to it. 
and require that even if they've come in through SSO, they need to assume a role to do this thing. And that's where they're putting in this secondary MFA. Can if you, you want that? it. Well, so, that's part of your assume role. That's part of the, the, the role itself, right? Um, is that you set up an MFA device there. You would set it up the same way mm -hmm. and that the, the, the role that the, uh, that the SSO user ends up in just has permissions to assume that role, just like an IAM user would. But, but the MFA, owner. is the MFA not only associated with IAM users though? I mean, how, how, do, how would you, in a world where we have no IAM users, how do you have an, a, an MFA? It's a good question. To second, I'm not to sure. Second this is in. something that I'm thinking yeah. about off the cuff. That, that, that's to, totally um, true, totally cool. Yeah, um, yeah no, that's um, fine. I, I was wondering I think, whether you yeah. could use an MFA and I don't know if this is if there's a security hole in this, but if you use an MFA up at the um, up at the the identity provider level, um, can that be sent through as a SAML assertion to say that an MFA was used that you could then use as a, con a conditional in a policy somewhere? Right, and that's what I'm saying. You 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 may be able to do that, mm. but I don't see that it's a usable it's control because of the lack of the ability of the user to influence. Yeah, it. Right, you you need the ability to say I'm doing something where I need MFA. It's not prompting me for MFA. Let me turn it on. Yeah, it's not robust. Or, it's robust yeah. in it. I mean, from a security point of view, it's kind of robust in the right direction. It's like not yeah. letting you in rather than letting you in by default. But it's not it's not robust, right? Well, and the other thing is, if these IDPs have MFA turned on anyway, right, which is often true. Mm. Um, you may still want, right, part of the MFA bit for the, the like I am user, right, was not just have they used MFA, but also I want this sort of positive action to be taken before they're able to do this particular AWS action, mm, mm. right? You know, which is a, you know, a confirmation step essentially. Yeah. And I think that's where, you know, if you look at how this might work, it that may turn into, you know, that sort of positive assertion is, explicit role assumption, right? You can go in through AWS SSO, but you don't have direct permissions to do the thing. You have to directly say, I want to assume this role to go do this, you know, particular sensitive thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that, that uh, um, means that you just have to do it, right? You, you always have permissions to do it because you've always used MFA, right? There's, there's no MFA involved, but it is sort of the notion that you can't just assume this thing and go about doing everything that you want this person to be able to do. It's an auditable action as well, isn't it? Like I, I'm making this decision to go and do this thing. It's true, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, awesome. I think, yep. so that's, that's the part of the downstream side of AWS SSO that I'm excited about. Um, I think the uh, the upstream side of it is the way in which the interaction with these IDPs is now standardized, right? That there have been many tools, innumerable tools written by people to integrate programmatically their IDP with AWS role assumption, right? And there have been a couple that are open source. Awesome is, is one of them. Um, you know, Okta had their has their own you know CLI tool for for integrating with AWS, um, all these things, and it's because you need this knowledge of the IDP to go retrieve like the SAML assertion or the web token, and then you have to get that and then bring that yourself to AWS, and so then you do STS assume role from SAML as a user, right through the through whatever CLI tool you're using or whatever. Sure. Um, and the trouble with that is um, that every IDP is different. Not all of them have APIs. You know, all those things makes it difficult. AWS SSO flips that around and says, AWS SSO knows how to talk to your IDP, right? Through OAuth or whatever it is, um, they're able to dispatch you over when you're signing in. And your point of sign in to AWS is actually through AWS SSO. And then what that's enabled is that AWS SSO can pr present interfaces that allow you to do that authentication without ever the things that are interacting with AWS SSO understanding the IDP. So this is why the AWS CLI v2 can do AWS SSO login 
without needing an update when they added support for ping. Right. Because the the so the interface that the CLI uses uh, uses the OAuth device grant, which is how like your smart TVs log in, right? When you like log into YouTube on a smart TV, it's like, oh, here, go to youtube.com slash activate and enter this code. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. In the background, your TV is going to YouTube and saying, I'm starting this authentication process. And then you go to the browser and you enter the code and then that matches it up with the device. And then YouTube says, okay, great, here's credentials. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. And with, and the trick is of course, that doesn't actually have to be on different devices. So with the AWS CLI, they just pop up your browser yeah. with that URL and you can go in. But if you're on an EC2 instance where it's headless, it prints out that URL. You can go to the URL and enter the code yourself. Right, yeah, of course it would, yes. That's not, some, that's not a path I've actually done, but yes, of course that would yeah. work, yeah, yeah. Um, and, so, uh, and so that's really cool, right? And then the CLI, because what it's doing when it pops up the browser, is it sending you to a URL that's SSO specific? SSO goes and looks up your, uh, your IDP, forwards you over there, which redirects you back to AWS SSO after you authenticate, and then it, AWS SSO gets the SAML assertion from the IDP and then grants the credentials back down to the device, to the CLI, uh, through that process. The, the, yeah, this, this. See, I've been using this and I've been yeah. doing all these things, but I haven't really properly been appreciating sort of some of the impacts and, and actually some of, some of the way that it works behind the scenes. Yes. That's and so, yep. Nice. And so That's then nice. what, the, what the CLI actually gets is an OAuth token from that standardized OAuth spec. And that represents your login to AWS SSO. So it doesn't actually represent credentials to any particular account or role yet. So then there's a separate set of APIs that you can take that token to. And this is where you can query to say, tell me what accounts I have access to with this. Mm -hmm. And then for a given account, you can say, tell me what roles I have access to. And then when you have an account and role, either that you've selected because you've looked at the lists or because you knew it ahead of time, you go to it and you say, give me the credentials for this particular account and role. And then it gives you back AWS credentials, the access key, secret key, and session token. Short lived, yes. Um, yep. And so, uh, and then what's nice is that access token lasts for the length of your session. Right. And the, uh, um, and so you can go back and get credentials for the same role or a different role or whatever with that same token over and over until your session expires. You can also log it out that if there's a there's an API yep. to take a token and say invalidate this token. Um, but that's what powers when you do AWS configure SSO on the command line, and it shows you a list of your accounts and then the roles and will configure a profile for you. Yep. So yeah, I'm 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 spending a lot of my time doing that through the through the web interface, and it does a very similar thing, right? Yeah. So you get you get the big long list of things. Um, in addition to that, from a from a from a machine learning standpoint, and I don't I don't know how many other things there are there. Obviously, you can link in SSO to, you know, Dropbox and all these other kinds of things, but you can also link it into internal AWS services such as uh, SageMaker Studio. So I can have yep. icons there for SageMaker Studio and use my SSO to dive straight into that. Yeah, and I think it's unfortunate. We're not there yet on how that should work. Right. So I've looked at EMR Studio and in particular, and I assume SageMaker Studio works the same way. In SageMaker Studio, you have to specify the permissions that people get. In SageMaker Studio. Um... Yes. So, well, yes. When you're setting up the user for it, then you would have a you have an ability to set up the permissions there. Yes. Right. And so, what you end up with is that these aren't integrated as first party services; they're integrated as third party services. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And so, um, this whole nice thing about having this centralized view of the permissions people have and the grants people have is lost on these first party AWS applications for the moment. Sure. I would like to be able to say here's the collection of permissions that I'm granting for this person to use with SageMaker Studio. Yes, I suppose that uh, the, the thinking here is that um, they're very different types of people and that really they are sort of, it's a it is a third party application in that respect because these people not, are- right? Well, I may it's- be granting, 
because I may be granting, I'm granting permission to AWS resources. That is true, right? yes. So I'm giving, I'm setting the, I'm attaching these IAM policies right, right. to these users that are in the SSO directory, but I'm doing that operation inside SageMaker and inside EMR Studio. Now I need, than... I need to, sorry, I need, I need to, I need to get it. I need to remind myself in more detail how this works. So I spent a lot of time working with, um, with Jupyter Notebooks, for example, as opposed to SageMaker Studio, certainly in the Jupyter Notebooks world. And I think maybe in the studio world, you're actually giving a, uh, a role to the, to the instance you're running on. So you're actually, so whilst there are some permissions on the user level, um, and I'm need, I need to check what they are you are yeah. you're absolutely giving like sort of basically uh, a, a role to the instance to be able to go and for example spin up infrastructure and the like so there is a decoupling there between those well except but that's not what you want the whole point about aws sso is that it's carrying identity further through that process right and so um the uh let's see let me just uh see if there's a create studio bit in SageMaker that I can just pull up to see if it works similar from uh, um, EMR Studio. Yeah. So the way that EMR Studio works is that you say, here's a user identity or group identity, and that's coming from the SSO identity store, which is either the internal identity store users that you've created or the users that you've synced from your external IDP. And then you say, for this identity, here's a set of IAM policies that I want you to associate with that user. Right. And then you say, here's the user role for the studio, which needs to have all the permissions that anybody who might use the studio would have. And then what happens is that when you authenticate to AWS SSO, it sends over the identity of the person who authenticated, so that user ID, and then, uh, EMR Studio says, I'm going to assume that role, but I'm going to add these scope down policies. So that this particular role session has the permissions according to the policies that you've, that you've associated with them within EMR Studio. What that means is if I'm looking at IAM analysis, right? I can only see that there are these, there's this role that's got lots of permissions to the data. And I have to go and look into the EMR API to understand what particular people have which particular permissions within EMR Studio. And so I've gone from having the identity and all of this permission structure and assignments and all this stuff inside AWS SSO to skipping out of AWS during authentication to EMR Studio, and then back into having AWS concepts and I don't think that's useful, right? What I would rather do is back in AWS SSO say, all right, great. This person is going to get access to EMR Studio with this collection of permissions. Mm. And then they become that exact IAM principle, right? In the same way as if they're doing it from the CLI, right? Sure. Is that they get those. And what's nice about that is that because SSO is actually doing the role assumption, that uh, there's a context key for their uh, identity, like that identity ID is a context key in the session. So you can actually create policies that depend on a particular user identity. Um, and that's something that's lost when you're going out through this other path. Sure. I, yeah, okay, I, I need to... I'm in a situation here where I need to yeah. dig into um, into SageMaker Studio and, and confirm a few things about my understanding of that. I've spent most of my time working from it from a clicking buttons point of view, but you're you're raising a, a very important and interesting question, and something that we need to understand a bit more about if if AWS is going to do more of this type of thing. Yeah, and 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 maybe they will because I mean we're seeing such a spread of new services and and it's great right domains should, yep you should be treating the users of these services should be treating them like SaaS applications not like aws resources yes right they shouldn't have to be thinking about i'm logging into a particular aws account as a particular identity 
and then using those resources from the console, right? They should be thinking about, I'm going to SageMaker Studio. Sure. That's from the user end. From the admin end, you absolutely need to be thinking about which account is this in, what permissions am I granting in that account and cross account, right? All of those things. Um, and AWS SSO is a great way to do that. Um, and I think that's where that functionality needs to get pulled back, where essentially, instead of saying, I'm granting this collection of permissions to an AWS, like to this user in an AWS account, you say, I'm granting this collection of IAM permissions to this user in this particular AWS application. Yeah, sure, sure. So then you say, here's a studio ARN, right, as the target. Yeah. And then they can go in, but it goes through the eight, AWS SSO is the thing that ends up giving the credentials out rather than this thing where SSO only serves to, to hand over a user ID to a service that then does an assume roll call separately. For sure. Goodness me. Yes. All right. That wasn't expecting that. <laughs> yeah. So um, well, I think, yep. No, go the, ahead. The, the, the kind of things that it enables, right? So I've written this AWS SSO util Mm -hmm. library, CLI tool and library. And it, you know, because I'm excited about these things, because I'm excited about, you know, that a Python script that you write can, you know, get a Boto3 session for a particular account and role on behalf of a user, logging them into their, through their IDP without having to understand the IDP in the same way that the CLI works, Yeah. Okay. right? Um, yes. And I would love for that to be in Boto 3 itself. Um, but in absence of that, I, I made a library to, to make it happen. Um, and, uh, and similarly that, you know, applications, I want it integrated into Amplify, Yeah. right? If you could use AWS SSO auth in Amplify, the amount that you'd be able to, you know, enterprise teams would be able to have a super simple way of standing up their own web apps that use the enterprise qualified authentication that they need for you know security to be okay with it. Yes. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Amplify makes that standing up those web apps so easy that it would be that much easier for any of these teams to say, oh, we need an application that does this, or we need an interface for other teams to come to us to do something. And we know how to stand it up and we know how to make it, but we don't want to have to, you know, have a cognito pool for it. Yeah, you know, that we yeah. have to sign users up. It's just like, oh yeah, just say amplify add auth SSO and it's now all linked to you know the corporate directory and everything. So I will link to your GitHub repo sure. for this for this um, effort that you're putting in there. And you you've got blog articles on this as well, haven't you? That I, I think that you were you, or are they still in progress? You you mentioned that you had something coming out. Oh no! Well, I wrote up something about code artifacts. That was a while ago. Oh, okay. I thought um, you were, you were right, right. You, 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 the stuff you were releasing around SSO as well. Maybe maybe the contents in. Oh, in, in the I should GitHub. write up a blog post about there that. There you go. <laughs> as, an in, as an introductory thing, that's yeah. probably a good idea. There you um, go. It would probably slip from my mind if I mentioned it before. But that's a good good motivation to to to, to get on that. Yes. No. I, you, you, yes. You, you've you've said it's a good idea. You haven't committed to necessarily writing it. We'll just make that. Uh, or it just fell clear. out of my mind. <laughs> Awesome. Okay, look, um, thank you so much. But this has been a very deep dive discussion on SSO, which was more than I was yeah. expecting. So thank you. And um, look, we can talk uh, about it pretty much forever. <laughs> well, maybe we'll Identity, have to sort of, security, we'll have to look back around when quality. when more more things happen in this space. Um, so yeah, look, thank you so much for that. Um, it's been great to catch up as well. And these things are important to make sure, as we've talked about before, for, for maintaining community. So thank you. And um, yeah. hey, Ben Kehoe, I shall talk to you again soon. Yeah, great. And anyone watching, reach out to, to me on Twitter. Absolutely. Um, feel free to say hi, um, as we would at reInvent. And we'll, yes, keep, 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 the community, keep the hallway track going. Yes. Thank you. All right. Goodbye. Bye.